Well, it's a pleasure to be in front of you today. And today you're making out, you're making out in the deal here because it says five, but you're actually getting seven approaches. So yeah, it works out to a pretty good discount. So what we're going to look at today is uh, a lot of this work is based on my research, uh, for my doctoral dissertation, and it will eventually become a book on comparative approaches for working with children on the autism spectrum. So how do we make sense of this applied behavioral analysis, teach, floor time, Miller method, daily life therapy, uh, RDI, and so on? And which one is the best approach? Which one do we use for the child or adult we are supporting? So this is some of the stuff that we're going to be burrowing into today. So yeah, I can't hear myself either. <laughs> Uh, we'll see if we can get a little more juice from the AV. All right. Is that better? No, still not better. All right, I'm going to keep talking and see if we can get better sound. Sounds like it's getting better. How's that? All right, good. Can you hear me even in the back? All right, if you can hear me in the back, flap your hands. I think we still need a little more. See if we can take it to the edge, but before we get to feedback. So before we get started, a little bit about me and my experiences. Things were pretty typical for me for the first 18 months. I was born after a five-hour labor. My mother, I had an APGAR of nine. And at 24 hours of age, I looked like an egg. <laughs> then the autism bomb struck. At 18 months, there was a lot of loss of functional communication, tantrums, withdrawal from the environment, self-stimulatory self activities, self-abusive behavior. And my parents were just utterly confused as to what happened. So where did this bomb come from? Well, before we take a brief look at the research, let's sing to the tune of Where Oh Where has this little dog gone, ready, Go. Where, oh, where did this autism come from? More from the basis. Where, oh, where can it be? More from the back together. With mysteries cut long and eye contact cut short. Oh, where, oh, where can it be from? Very good, very good. Well, I think we need a little work on staying together and breath support, but. Eventually, we'll have it going in four-part harmony, and we'll be ready for the spring concert. <laughs> and what we're looking at here is the why. Carrie Bowers talked a lot about various Ws of autism, the why she's leaving to the scientists. And you know, the best minds seem to believe that we start out with a genetic predisposition. So I see autistic characteristics running in families. I remember the first child I worked with, and when I met the dad, I said, hey, dad, I think you're autistic. <laughs> Takes one to know one, I guess. He didn't like that. Well, as time went on, I found out that he didn't eat solid foods until he was nine and a half. And he has a negative autism diagnosis, and that's what I call it, from Children's Hospital in Boston. After spending six months as an outpatient, the result was a letter, dear mom and dad, your child cannot be autistic because he's talking. Well, now we know what that's called. It's called Asperger's syndrome. And now this man realizes that if he's not on the autism spectrum, he's awfully darn close. He is what my friend Jerry Newport would refer to as, and he has a good word for the word recovered, recovered aphid. What does aphid stand for? Autistic parent heavily in denial. <laughs> Maybe you know of some. And that helps him understand his son much better, now that he recognizes his own autistic characteristics. How many people here are on the autism spectrum? All right, good. Well, there'll be more of you by the time I'm done. <laughs> so we start out with the genetic predisposition, which then gets triggered by something else. And we have, we, we have people looking at possible role of vaccines. Some people say yes, some people say no. Uh, there are some things that we can do to make vaccines safer while we try to figure this out in the process. 
Other people are looking at diet. We see many people on the spectrum needing to be on special diets, such as gluten and casein-free diets, because the digestive systems are so compromised that foods containing gluten, casein, so we're dealing, talking about wheat products and dairy products, the little particles of protein leak through the gut, that's why they call it leaky gut, find their way to the brain and create an opiate effect. So it's like the child is on drugs. And I know many children and adults on the spectrum who really need to be on a diet like this, or maybe other special diets. And then there are others who are on, what you might say, the seafood diet. That's right, we see food and we eat it. So just like all, kind, all kinds of interventions that you're hearing about here and other, and other locations through research that you're doing, it all depends on the needs of the person on the autism spectrum. Are we doing something to the environment? Why is it that when I was diagnosed and all through grade school, I was the only child I knew on the autism spectrum? The accepted incidence rate was one out of 10,000. A little earlier today, Peter Bell talked about one out of 2,500, 25, I think. But he was going back only 13 years. Uh, but in this case, I'm going back to when, well, let's see, there wasn't any electricity then, so we were running our computers by candlelight. <laughs> so one out of 10,000. Now, if I think back to the, my classmates, some of them probably should have been diagnosed. But it doesn't take into account the fact that we now have entire roomfuls in schools of children with pervasive developmental disorders. There are entire schools, five private schools for children with autism within bicycling distance of my home in Boston. That's a lot of autism. And there are indications that even that may be understating the total number. If we hop across the pond over to England, the UK, they're talking about incidence rates of 1.35%. I think that's about one out of 70. That's a lot of autism. And what we do know is that if the incidence rate keeps increasing the way it has been, within the next generation, oh, there'll still be an autism today. But, and we'll have conferences just like this, but it will be for people who are not on the autism spectrum. Because <laughs> there'll be more of us than there are of you. And the long and short of it is part of what makes autism so slippery is that we have no conclusive evidence as to the cause or causes, multiple causes of autism. If you don't know what causes a condition, it makes it harder to work with. Not impossible, but it does make it harder. Oh, here's our friend, the DSM. This will be a good old fashioned DSM thumping, foot stomping autism revival. Now, if we look at the DSM, we look at the characteristics of challenges in communication. And that's most striking in the children who are nonverbal. But those of us who are verbal, there may be challenges in non decoding nonverbal communication. We see difficulties in socialization, making friends at school, knowing what to do during unstructured time in recess. We see highly focused, restricted interests, so restricted they can get in the way of socialization, learning, and other things. So as I talked about all these characteristics,